Welcome to the show. I'm so happy that you're here. And I'm so looking forward to today because I have a great friend, this incredible woman who you're going to adore as much as I do. I know Nancy Weber, who I feel like we're kindred spirits that I've known you forever and ever. Um, Nancy is known as the psychic detective, has had this very interesting life as an author, has done so many things in her life. To me, though, Nancy, the greatest thing you've done, welcome to the show, by the way, the, oh, greatest, you. thing you've, <laughs> the greatest thing you've done is be authentically you 100% of the time. Like thank from you. the moment I met you, I knew who you were. I, I could feel it. I feel your heart. You're so generous and kind and so giving and loving. And uh, before we went on air, you made a statement that I thought that's so true, but you, you can choose to live two different ways, hmm. right? Right. You can either have you, <laughs> your life driven by love or driven by fear, your choice in every circumstance, right? Yeah. And years ago, I wrote something that summed up for me, my own feelings of when I am on earth, I am with the mother. When I am no longer on earth, I am with the father. Either way, I am home. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. When I met you, <laughs> we didn't know that it was such an instant ditto. Mm -hmm. We found out afterwards, but oh my God, I was so thrilled that you were part of the author group. It was funny. I went, a human being, I love her. <laughs> I felt the same, the same with you. So yeah, yeah, an immediate connection and I love it. And yeah. so Nancy, you've had such an interesting life. And, uh, you know, um, a lot of Christians watch this show and different Christians feel different ways about the spiritual world and what's going on and things that we don't see and and what we're able to know. And and like, I can say, I personally, I've I've had dreams that have, that have, come to pass. I've, I've had things. I think that we're, we have this intuition, this gut that we don't listen to enough, maybe sometimes. Right. And, and how, how we decide to embrace it and listen. Like, I, I think with, with God, like it should be, I, I love a conversation, not just a Give me this, give me that. I pray for this. I pray for that. Right. And I, and I, I, so I have conversations. And so what, do you ever run into people that go psychic? Mm -hmm. Come on. Oh, sure. Oh, what yeah. first one early on, <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, the first one was a, um, talking at a rotary club, I guess I had, been involved and they all knew it at the time I it, once it was all adjudicated a serial killer case and they all wanted to know more of the details that were permitted because I had an oath I had taken at the police academy so I kept everything confidential but others spilled the beans right so I am talking at the Rotary Club and finish and they're all going yay great job except for one guy he gets up and he looks at me and goes you're from Satan and I went you believe in Christ? He goes, yeah. I said, then pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, right. I am not in charge of the universe, nor is anybody else. So I have no idea. I leave it up to each of us to discover the gratitude and thankfulness for having an experience of being in a body, because we're not the body, but we're having an experience in the form in this amazing planet, which is part, a small part of the whole creation that is constantly being created. It is the most amazing experience when we look at it that way. When we look at it as, I had to pay a bill. <laughs> I think, oh, really? Do you know, would you like to wire the whole house so you can turn on a switch and have light and create incandescent lights or LEDs or whatever you create? Go for it. I'm filled with gratitude about only needing a switch. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. It's yeah. so true. You know, it's like, it's like our attitudes just dictate our entire life. Mm -hmm. And, and it's something we get to pick, 
you know, I think so often people think that they, or they allow other people to, to influence their attitude, but they're allowing other people to influence their attitude. You know, there's plenty of people that want to bring you down, right? There are plenty of people that are naysayers and you, you get to decide if you're going to listen to the, the rhetoric or if you're going to go, no, that's, you know, I want to be happy. I have a question for you. What brought you to that? Uh, what brought me to that? Um, you know, I'll tell you, I had this moment in Haiti as I was working on this, I, you know, I dedicated a year to figure out the true meaning of love. And, and I had this moment um, while I was working on it, when I was working on uh, Love Keeps No Record of Wrongs, because I was using 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, et cetera, and taking one word or phrase a month and diving in. And um, I, it was a tough situation. I was in this horrible, put into this horrible situation. But again, however you look at it, for me, now I look at it, great learning opportunity, incredible learning opportunity. And, um, and I was angry because at the time I was looking at it as, oh, this is just so hard and this is just so wrong. And why are people like this? And, you know, what's going on? And then I, it occurred to me, I'm working on love keeps no record of wrongs. And, and I realized what that meant is I get to pick the narrative. I pick the narrative, right? You don't have to let other people pick your narrative. You get to pick your own narrative. So instead of all these rotten people that are doing this rotten thing, it's, wow, what did I learn from it? And, you know, how am I going to treat people differently because of it? And, and how am I going to take it? And, and also realizing I've not walked in their shoes. You know, every, every day we live leads us to today. And you, the only shoes you walked in are your very own. I mean, you can have a twin and not walk in their shoes, right? right? And yeah, so all of our thoughts and beliefs, all that stuff. I mean, it's the accumulation of, of the days we've lived. And so we get to choose our narrative. We get to pick it. Every so often, you open up new doors, right? In For us, as you talk. So you just opened me back to an, a door. I met somebody in 1976 who gave a lecture and I bought the little book on the Lord's prayer that he did in Aramaic mm -hmm. and explained the language direct and said something that stayed with me forever. And he said, you know, uh, Jesus did not speak Greek. And those translations are long after, but the direct translation of Aramaic, he studied with and then worked with for 10 years until death, Dr. George Lamsa, who was the world's expert on Aramaic. He lived in the Middle East. And so Nora Foundation, N-O-O-R-H-A, is his foundation, Dr. Rocco Orico. And when I was writing my newest book coming out in October 2024, I put him in it. And I then I went, oops, I got to let him know and see if he'll let me do it. So I wrote to him and told him how influential. And he wrote the kindest, sweetest letter back about it. One of the things I decided to look up because of what he said was the word psychic. Knowing that it had a root that most people don't know. And it comes from the Greek as many things do, right? Yes. <laughs> and it's Psyche was the one of the muses or goddess or whatever. And then there's a term called Shikaiko. That's how they pronounce it. Don't ask me to spell it. <laughs> it's P-S-Y-C-H-K-O, something like that. And it is referring to the soul in Greek. And when they translated it, they wrote it as P-C-Y-C-H-I-C. So psychic means soul. It means we're in touch with the greater consciousness of all life, I believe. And that when we are available to receive because our ego is not pushing or pulling on us and we're not trying to approve or reject what others are saying, we're just being, right? Mm -hmm. then, then our soul delivers the highest frequency of the light of God available to anybody. And so I always thought if I was born in a rice paddy in China in the 18th century, would I know about all the rest of the Western culture? No, I wouldn't. But I would also hold the same kind, if I was fortunate to consider, 
And probably I'd be more peaceful, actually, in a rice paddy. <laughs> probably <laughs> too. Surrounded by everything and anything. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I would be understanding the same thing that any philosophy, any religion, any thoughtful, anything that's truly personal, right? As holding mm -hmm. that narrative about creation, life, love. And as long as we're harmless, who cares? Right. Right. Yeah, I so agree. You know, it's, it's like, uh, I heard something yesterday, just yesterday, about how, um, how so often they were talking about how you are in your twenties, and then compared to forty, and then sixty, and then in your twenties, you're worried about what everybody thinks of you, and then when you're you're in your forties, you're like, I don't really care that much about what everybody thinks of me, and then when you're sick in your sixties, you're like, nobody's even thinking about me. Yeah, you come to that realization, right? That nobody's really thinking about you. <laughs> and so it, it's kind of like, well, you know, we, we should all be of that sort of in, the, in this other way. Like, um, we mm. don't need to be thinking about other people unless we're thinking about them in love and caring and help and, and, you know, fellowship and relationship. Right. But, you but not in condemnation. Yeah. But yeah. You're, <laughs> everything is for me, kinship with all souls. So whether it's talking with an animal, you know, mm -hmm. I have a book on that, animal communication. So I keep saying to people, stop looking at them as if they have fur and paws or feathers or fins or whatever. And can I share a little fish story? Please, please, please. Yes. It's a little fish. <laughs> In the Caribbean, uh, friends had gifted us with them a 10-day trip into the British Virgin Isles, and they were fabulous human beings, best friends. So they didn't want to go scuba diving or snorkeling. I have done both and loved both then. And my husband uh, couldn't see in the water because he wore thick glasses, et cetera, but he had a snorkel on and he was not comfortable in the water. So I tried to explain the buddy system, not that he understood a word of it nor cared. So we go diving into this wonderful place called Big Dog Island, which is uh, offshore, off everything. And the boat's about half a mile from us or a quarter of a mile, something like that, and anchored. And uh, it's a diving place. Lots of fish, lots of everything. A moray, uh, not a moray, a barracuda comes by and my husband freaks. <clears throat> and I send up a prayer and say, I need something to help guide him because he is so upset, but he will follow me. And all of a sudden, this little yellow fish, the size of my pinky, bops me on the nose and starts swimming. So I follow it because I can see the boat and I can see the line, this little fish. Fish don't go out of their own territory. This fish swam us to the boat. Wow. So my husband runs up the boat, gets in, and he is not a wimp at all. He is a tough guy, but man, was he so scared of the barracuda. I didn't know. Yeah. Oh, that's so I had been scuba diving long before I met him, and I'd gone 80 feet down, 50 feet free diving, nine minutes pregnant, nothing. I love water. So there I am with this little yellow, I won't go. He said, come on off the boat. I said, wait a minute. That little fish sat on my head swam around me. I could see up above just right here and then bopped my nose and swam back. Oh, wow. A little fish. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, that's so cool. I love that story. I love so that. That's soul to soul connection because he wasn't just a little fish. He was a messenger and a guide from the universe, blessed with knowledge and wisdom and kindness and compassion. What else can you hope for? Right, 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 right. right. Well, and and wow, <laughs> you're wah. frozen. Wah. Your voice is not coming in. Your voice is not. Try it again. Yep. From the time you said what, it stopped. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. 
So yeah, so I'll pick up there. So I often think, why the heck not? Like so often we want to put God in a box and say, well, that's not possible. God would never do that. You know, well, seriously, God wouldn't take one of his creatures and guide you back to a boat because, because why? Why, Wait a minute. why not? Wait a minute. How do we even judge? Right. I, I think I read a, uh, an interesting book many years ago called The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ. Now, as an Aquarian who was not born into a Christian home, I was always, I read the New Testament when I was 16. And I said, so what's the problem? Other than it may be translated a little off, I love history. I'll go research and see how much of this is what they're actually saying or what they were meant to say, et cetera. And I also knew the Jewish religion. So I knew the history of certain things didn't make sense to me on either end. And it was all interesting, but I love Zen. So I'm reading this book by supposedly a medium who knew the lost years of Jesus, but they were parables and they were fabulous. So there was one that stands out for us, I think, that kind of sums it up in my, so there were healing waters and people were running into the healing waters. You know, that's great. It's wonderful. Love it. And this little girl by a tree who couldn't walk. So she was sitting there peacefully. And Jesus goes over and says, would you like me to pick you up and put you in the water? And she goes, no, thank you. And he goes, well, I'm happy to do it for you. These are healing waters. Look at everybody. No, thank you. So he said, why? Why not? She said, God will heal me when God's ready to heal me. So he picks her up and goes, lo and behold, the child knows. <laughs> go, Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? It's beautiful. It is beautiful. I love it. Oh, my I God. I love that. And the other parable was about the pearls before swine. Mm -hmm. And it was the disciples he had taught and said, go out, go forth and teach. So they come back all bloodied and beaten up and stoned and they go, we don't get it. And he said, well, if you have diamonds in your pockets and you go to a town of starving people and dogs and you offer them your diamonds, what do you think they're going to do? Either take it, choke and hate you for it or it's not food. How will they relate? Stop mm -hmm. thinking that they should have what you have. Mm. You're not there to tell him what to do, any of them. You're there to help and support and love and lift. Good luck. Mm. <laughs> I read it, I go right on. <laughs> no kidding, no kidding. That's so good. That's so good. You know, that's something that I think about like when I, in Haiti or other Haiti. places. I was thinking yeah. about when I read your book, right. Yeah, because, I mean, you can talk about God being, you know, Jesus being the, the living waters, but they, how, how do you relate to living waters when you have no running water in your home? You're in Burkina Faso in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's a drought, and, and you're talking about Jesus being living waters, and they don't you have any water and the water that they have is out of a mud puddle. I mean, how can you relate or, or the bread of life? When when you don't even know if you're going to have bread that day, if you're going to be able to eat that day. Right. Nor will your children, nor will anyone. I know. I find that there is a philosophy I hold, kind of, I guess. And it's very simple. What actions are you taking to prove what you believe? Mm -hmm. Very simple. Stop talking about your faith of anything. I don't care what, unless you back it up with the actions that prove out you are a servant of the gift of life. Mm -hmm. We're gifted with life. You're a present, but so is everybody else. And if you have anything, then share. Mm. Very simple. How do you know? How do you, how do, I never understood how anybody can sit anywhere except when I was a little girl, you know, and my mother would try and get me to drink milk that I hated. It was, I, I raw milk was fine. I never had it until I was older and I loved it, but homogenized, pasteurized, everything I couldn't stand. So she would say, 
there are kids starving in India. And I go, ship it to them. <laughs> but philosophically, I understood later that, right, there are people, no matter how much I may be hurting about something, there are people far off, far worse off. What am I doing about them? I don't care what the circumstances are for me. If I have enough, a roof over my head and food on a table, whatever that may be, then I'm better off than 95% of the world. Then what am I doing about that? And I think that's what we call thank you, God. Mm -hmm. That's my mm -hmm. thank you. And recognition that whether it's luck or any, whatever anybody believes, you know, in the third council of Nicaea, I read about the queen killing off the popes because they wouldn't agree with her to strike out certain passages about Jesus and what he believed in reincarnation. The only one they couldn't strike out was uh, the blind guy on the road and the woman at the well. Mm. Those are two kind of circumstances that indicated certain belief, but they were less potent statements than the ones that were knocked out. So I was always curious about what they knocked out, right? Right, right. And I'm saying, yeah, I mean, if we have any kind of understanding that our souls are eons old, nobody knows how old our souls are. Mm -hmm. Our soul, spirit of our life is, our forms are not. So what if we had been in their shoes at that drought some other time on earth, cataclysmic, whatever, tsunamis, tsunamis and, and volcanoes and earthquakes. What if we had already had that? What would we want somebody else on another part of the world that was safe and could help do? Which mm. is what you did when you went to Haiti, right? You were preaching without preaching. Mm. You were a model, a demonstration of your beliefs, which is why I have loved you for the first moment I saw you. You were such a good, truthful soul, authentic. Yeah, it's amazing. Hello, I love you. <laughs> I love you. So it works both ways. But but it's so true. It's uh in in that um people can do everybody can do whatever it is they feel like they should do be who you believe you're created to be and 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 whatever you think is right when it comes to helping people do that but i i agree like uh there aren't that many people in the us that don't have extra like you know i can tell you i have too many clothes i can tell you that there are times that tomatoes go rotten in my refrigerator and I can tell you that sometimes I let the water run when I'm brushing my teeth. Hmm. While there are people, they have no food, clothing, and running water, uh, potable water, water to drink. And uh, it's easy to take things for granted and go, well, that's them. And what do I have to do with them? And But I do believe the greatest thing we can do is to share what we have and and the way to share the love of god is by service by helping others by doing what jesus did by doing what god wants us to do just love people and when you love people you want to help them and when you love people you don't want to preach to them mm -hmm. right you you recognize that that they are who they are and they're allowed to be whoever they are right you're not going to change anybody but sometimes people need a hand. They need food. They need water. They need something. And man, if you can give it, why why wouldn't you? You know, of course, of course. Sure. You know, I think a lot of good people do things. I just think that, as you said, it's easy to slip into just deep sigh and exhausted or doing a lot and forgetting, just forgetting. It, that were souls first. And I was blessed with having to stop everything. When I was 31, I was disabled. I left nursing and I just deep breathed and 
the world opened up in a very different way within shortly, within months. And I remember what I learned from it was very simple. Don't ever forget it's soul before form. Don't mm. ever forget you are a soul and a spirit before you are a form and after. Don't ever forget. And I practiced that as much as possible. It, I went around, I call it my OCD moments. When I feel something that is powerful and, and good for me, I don't shut up in my mind. That's what my mind repeats. I want that pattern. So if I am looking at something, uh, my husband may tend to keep some things a little bit longer than I would like, uh, or a lot longer. And I would say, you haven't used this ever. And he'd go, but I may. And I go, okay, you may, and you may not. But meanwhile, I want you to consider the people who can't afford any of this, and you can afford to go and get a new one when you want. Why not make room and see if you'll ever miss it and then gift it? Oh, okay. So when he throws something else out that I said, you have to because we need the space or whatever, I said, do you love that more than you love me? He goes, no. I said, then there shouldn't be a choice. So I keep telling him your soul in my own language. Sometimes it's not always <laughs> sweet, <laughs> but it is me and he knows, but he knows it's honest that always put your soul before everything and everyone else's soul when you're looking at them, when you're looking at your pet, you're not looking at a pet. You're looking at a domesticated species that enjoys your company and has chosen to be with you, even if you don't know, they chose you. They chose you and you chose them, it's mutual. So whether you rescue them or bread or whatever, you, and however you got them, then when you're talking with them, can you please forget that they're in fur and paws yeah. and just know that that's a soul. So I have a fun story about a soul, Please, right? So a woman called me in to, uh, because she had lost her, dog to end of life and missed him terribly and wanted to know if I could relate to him. And I said, I don't know, but I get the weirdest odd things. She said, what? He loved to dress up for holidays? Really? And she said, let me show you something. So she had an album of photos of him dressed up for different holidays. He would race and pick things with her, what he wanted, and he loved it and he would pose. And I thought, really? But that took me way back to a very interesting one that has, well, I have to be careful how I say this. So a client of mine who I was very close to, good friend, many years ago, her husband died. She came to me. She said, I'm heading to the funeral and I need to know, is he okay? And I said, he is, but he has a message that he forgot to pay the life insurance and he's apologizing and he knows it's a deadline. So she looked it all up and found she had four hours before closing. Oh. So she called up right away and, and and paid it off, goes to the funeral. And I told her that he also thanked one of the cousins for going fishing with him many years before. So she goes and she's standing by the coffin and her cousin comes over and she said, so her husband, Larry, uh, wanted to thank him for the fishing. He said, oh, he remembered? Well, when did he tell you that? She said, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, recently. <laughs> and then the priest came by and he said, why are you smiling? I said, and she said, because he's okay. Right? And he mm -hmm. said, that's, uh, please. She said, I thought you'd believe. And I think that's, you know, kind of the, Odd piece I found in some and others, no. I mean, others are such believers of everything that's exquisite in them and it shines in them like yourself. You know what you know is real for you as it is for me. I know what I know and how many experiences like working with detectives. I know that I was shown by the murder victims exactly how it happened. 
Mm. Otherwise, I couldn't have named the killer or told them where they were or took them right to where the body had been found or anything else. I was led, but I couldn't have been led unless I was in service from the light of God. I could not have been led. And I also believe we all get what we're meant to get and we're messengers. So sometimes we're not the messenger. We just say, don't have it. Don't know it. It's not mine to do. And we have to know that, mm -hmm. which is also very freeing. It's kind of like I'm sitting in a wheelchair. Well, I can't go and help in Haiti, but I can certainly do other things. Mm -hmm. So indigenous for the winter, I made hundreds of hats and knit them and crochet them in scarves for the kids and the seniors. I love doing that. I thought, it's like the, I believe the ancients understood with every stitch you make and every everything you do, cook or whatever you're doing, you're pouring your love into it for them, whoever them are, right? They are, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. I find that such a fun thing to do, sitting there in before winter, making sure they had it, because I, I had connections in the indigenous four tribes. And so I did probably 100, 150 of them. And quickly, because I wanted to make sure nobody froze. But mm -hmm. each one I did, I thought, I can I can be so excited by who opens it up mm -hmm. and takes it and can feel the love I have for them. I think that's what we're all about, actually. As you said, I, all the stuff around is stuff. Yeah. yeah. Right. But that connection we have. Oh, yeah. Everybody, not just family. Right. Right. And the thing too, that you, you pour your love into this and, and uh, so I, I have this and, and then the energy transfers with it. I, I love that. I, I have a friend who wrote a book called happy money and he talks about that with money, that money is, <laughs> is, has energy and if, take it begrudgingly, like, ah, oh, he's not paying me enough or he <laughs> undercut me or something like that. That's not happy money. But if you say, wow, I'm so grateful, you know, this is $50 more that I have today than I didn't have yesterday. I'm so grateful to have this money. There's a whole different energy right around the money. Yeah. Oh, okay. So <laughs> yes. when I realized that at 31, I'm writing checks. Con Edison was New York City Electric Company at that time. I lived in Westchester County, I guess. And I'm writing the check and I'm going... Thank you. So I got all kinds of stickers to put on envelope and in the memo on the check, I would put, thank you so much. And I'd put a little smiley face or something on it because I wanted people who opened up the checks to smile. I didn't want them to feel like, oh, no, I have to work, I have to work. <laughs> that kind of thing. And I thought, and gratitude. And I made a promise that I would tithe the moment I had more money than no no money saved, no nothing other than what's right there in front of us. And as soon as I did, I was thrilled. I got fun stickers for the envelopes. And as a consequence of having done that, <laughs> when I moved from one place to another year, years later, because I kept doing that, fun stickers, flowers, everything on the envelopes of anything I sent. When they forwarded my mail, they forwarded it for 10 years on their own. Because oh. I was the faith mail they ever had at the mail at the post office. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. That's so cool. I love that. I love and I had so much fun doing that. Right? But it, it was gratitude for having any money to do anything of value for life. It didn't matter what. And it still, it is. I want so people, I hope I pay a lot of taxes. And they said, what? I said, well, first of all, I believe in education. So I don't care where you live. I want you to have the money for good schools. I want you to have money for good health. I was blessed with being a nurse and then trained in many other fields of health care on my own. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling very comfortable about me, but that doesn't mean you're getting the training for nothing. I'm sorry. I want the taxes to go there. And if I have a lot of money paying for taxes, it means I have a lot of money. What's That's my right. problem? That's right. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So if true. I have the money or not, it's self-value. 
Mm -hmm. It's a byproduct of value. And when we put a value to what we do, we don't have to be like jingling our change and counting our dollars because we're business people, whether we are or not, doesn't matter. But it's more an emotional and mental and physical state of mind that what can I do with it to benefit my, my family and the world, mm -hmm. personal and universal, personally. And if there's out of balance, it's like self-care. If I don't care for me, but I care for others and I teach them everything. I love healthcare, te self-care teaching. Love it. I've been a holistic health practitioner forever. First nursing teacher taught us that term. So I'm good. I love that. But that doesn't mean I should model it. Right? And share it. Right? right? And just right. make sure that whoever needs it, if I can share and know something that you don't know right now, not stuff it down you, not push you, but just share, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I love, that's one of my favorite things. I do it pretty much every day. And it's important to me because I'm not young anymore and I want to make sure I <laughs> pour out everything that has been gifted to me mm -hmm. as education and mm -hmm. knowledge, but not only from the earth, from our major benefactor. Yes. Yes. Amen to that for sure. Yeah. You know, uh, I think about that with everything that you do, Nancy, you make it very obvious that it comes from this place of wanting to give, wanting to share, wanting to help. And like, even when, when you're working with police departments, I think about people who have lost somebody like a, if I were ever, man, I just cannot even imagine being in a position where someone that's close to me was, was murdered. Like I, I not had that experience. I, I can't imagine that happening. What I can sort of imagine is that if it did happen, I'd want to know who did it. And I'd want to know they're not going to do it to somebody else. Okay. And right. So yeah. even in that, and then, and going out and helping and, and, you know, bringing in people so that they can't hurt somebody else and bringing closure to families and bringing um, some sort of peace back into people's lives. What a gift is that, Nancy? That I, I just can't, tell me what's, what, what is that like for you? It's, a, well, first, there's a woman, Peggy Goble. She's on Nancy Grace show with me years ago. She and I still talk. In the 1980s, her sister was murdered. I found the murderer. However, she had, the woman was 42, I think, when she died, Elizabeth Cornish. And she was a nurse. And she had five daughters. All of them, and Peggy, and Elizabeth's boyfriend at the time, Paul. I have still been in communication, particularly with Peggy, for years. And we've also together talked about another case that happened right there that I was working on because she knew everybody about everything now. I worked with the chief um, investigator at the prosecutor's office. It was a small uh, office. And so I had worked with him on two of the cases, this was the second one. And I insisted, I argued with him by then. So Peggy, for instance, and the daughters, first, the shock, you know, we call it locking, the shock locks itself in tight. Mm -hmm. And after that, the, the long-term grieving is never over. It really, you know, you've lost somebody you dearly love. And so I have lost several and I know we never forget. We go through a period of mourning, however short or long, up to us. And then every so often we open up, we can cry buckets and they live differently. There was a research that said people who have been through and live through a tsunami or a volcano or 
eruption or anything, earthquake, uh, that others might not have. They're not as traumatized as people who are crime victims. Mm, wow. wow. Because it's our own species turning against us, uh -huh. which rippling effect puts everybody in trauma. Mm. I was a crime victim more than once by different people before the age of, I don't remember, 27, I think. And then once again in my 30s. And what I learned was very simple. Uh, the more you recognize your soul, the kinder you are to yourself about healing, right? Mm. So when I work with them, whether they're on the other side or here, I've sat with loads of rape victims, loads of almost murder victims. Um, I have what I think of as boundaries that are not walls. Hmm. Because I believe that crimes have been committed ever since we were maybe out of the ocean or upright or whatever. I'm sorry, but this is humans and fear will drive them in the wrong direction. You know, a little fear, okay. You can gain control. A lot of fears, not always. And we now know with the poisoned planet, good luck. Parasites, insecticides, pesticides, poisoning the planet constantly. We've got plastic particulates in the air, almost globally. So good luck to everybody on what it does to the brain. So I went and started doing everything I could naturally and or what we'll call organically here because it should be natural. Organic should be the way. It's before we got all the plastic and all the rest. Mm -hmm. I find that it helps me recover from any of the things. I've been through trauma, but because I've been through it and I know grief therapy and I have my one of my my dearest friends in the world who wrote the forward for my book, she is a grief therapy expert, specializes in it for a long time. And her sister sits on the board of Helping Parents Heal, who lost her 24-year-old uh, years ago. And Helping Parents Heal is an organization that is only spiritually based, no religion, no nothing. It's all, they don't care well, how you lost your child and how old you are or they were. This is everybody, and it started with a couple who lost theirs. And when they have a convention, they had Eric Clapton music, Garth Brooks, and mm -hmm. they're amazing people. They have kitchen table talks. They have grief therapists, uh, and they have mediums and psychics because they want the people to know you can talk to your own child. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there, I think in many ways, we are in the other part of all this really unique species in that when we encounter the issues that we create, mm -hmm. then those are those and they stick out. And then the rest of us are going, so what can we do about that and how we can help? And that's the foundation of every nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, right. every foundation. Right. So I look at that and say, I'm just one uh, and it's work. So when I get called into something, I do what I can, then I'm done. I don't look, I don't care if I <sighs> know the answers at the end or they tell me what happened or don't. That's up to them. I'm just part of the puzzle. If I can help at all, I don't have the murder book. I don't, I'm not. Sometimes I'm given everything to look at afterwards and they go, oh, okay, this is where this fits and this and, you know, we're good. But unless I'm working with people I've known for years, I don't know the outcome of anything I'm working with and I don't care. That's not my job. Mine mm -hmm. is if I'm in receipt of being a messenger, good. If it can help, good. If it can't, at least we gave it a good try. That's, that's work. Mm -hmm. And I keep it that way in order. You know, there are certain people hmm, I was given many years ago because I worked on uh, two of the three man, biggest manhunts in Jersey. And the other one was the Lindbergh kidnapping. I wasn't born yet. So this yeah. one was the um, serial killer. 
And because I worked on it, somehow my bookkeeper saw the documentary, came in and said to me, you know, I worked for the father of Deirdre O'Brien. And I said, no, I didn't know. She said, well, I was his right hand man. And uh, the chief prosecutor gave him all the information, every detail of everything happening, police report, everything. And here it is. He was going to write a book. Instead, he opened up Deidre's house, which is a looking like a gorgeous hotel, no uniforms or anything. It is for children of abuse. It's mm. fabulous. Wow. And so he decided to do that. And he gave it to her and said, do whatever you want with the manuscript. And she gave it to me. I ended up giving the original to her brother, Deirdre's brother, who asked, I, well, they were filming here last year for some crime files. And I said, I have the original. Let me show you what they said here and here. And I'm pulling it out. And I, they told me he was going, they were going next to the brother. And I said, tell him I have the original manuscript of his father. And then I wrote a letter when I gave it to him and said, be very careful. You may not be able to read more than two or three pages. Mm -hmm. uh, I read probably about 100 pages, hysterical crying, couldn't stop for days. Mm -hmm. uh, because I knew every detail, but rereading what the family went through. Mm -hmm. And then Crime Files did an incredible case on it. Um, uh, I was piece of it, like it should be just a piece here and piece. They pieced it all together and they had everything. I watched it once, cannot watch it. Mm. Brings it all up because it's so real of what, you know, people go through. However, I think that's okay. My pain is nothing compared to what they do, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Nothing, it's mm -hmm. small. I'm not it. I am an observer who has compassion. That's it. So I'm entitled to let it out. I don't want to keep it in, but it has nothing to do with, oh my God, what they have to live with the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Beyond, 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 beyond anything. All of them, all the murder victims, all the rape victims who, while well, I was one, I knew how to recover. Well, you know, I can go, uh, you may have touched my body, but you're never going to touch my soul. You're so disconnected from your soul. It's not funny. So, and I know how to read my, release it, and do my work. It's different. And I'm thrilled that I am different in that way, that I have recovered from so many different attacks uh, physically, that I'm good. Uh I think I was gifted with those, actually, as odd as it sounds. So I can sit with anybody and say, yeah, I know exactly what that's about, right? Right. Uh, I love standing in the fire, right? Yeah. Hospice work. I've sat and lived with my friends who were dying, dressed the one was Jewish. I dressed her body, did her eulogy. I'm a minister. Um, just kind of holistic health freedom church spiritually based but I, i've sat with both of my two of my closest friends well, through there last month every single day was there taking care sat with the dead body for a while until somebody came to do the prayers or whatever um i'm not it in anything except my own life just like you keep saying you know it's your narrative so what is your narrative, regardless of anything? I, my rapist, it's not their narrative. Mm -hmm. um, you go and find your way. But if I can report you, if I can lock you up, if I can, I, I'd be willing in today's world, I am that way. I go, hmm, if I can frame them, I would. If <laughs> I have, you know, if I know you did it and I don't have proof because you did it to me, but I'm guaranteed it won't work in justice. I will find a way for it to work in justice. And I don't care. I would live with that very comfortably. <laughs> well, yeah, because, because it's not just redemption for you. Oh, but it's for whoever else they might hurt. Well, that, that's the whole point. I know how strong I am on mm -hmm. everything. Uh, I might... 
I think my husband's afraid of me. So <laughs> I think not really. <laughs> but I can get justice for what I need when I learned how to stand up. As you said, it's my own narrative, and that's what I had to learn also. You know, you had a pivotal moments, you had them before that also. Mm -hmm. I know you had to, because mm -hmm. you were already who you are strongly. You know, I look, and that's why I thought, oh my gosh, she's so real. I love her so much. Because you didn't get that all from doing St. Paul's letter and the book. You got that idea to do it because of who you are. Mm -hmm. Right? Which is the culmination of all your life experience, so beautifully caring and consistent, right? I don't know if you were boundary and that narrative was back then. It was and wasn't for me. Wishy washy depends on the moment. But when I learned how to stand up, I wrote to a judge on child support. I wrote to the president of the White House at the time, Ronald Reagan. I got answers in seven days. I got answers after years of not. I just wrote to the top. And judges are not supposed to look. And the court clerk, I call. That was Friday. Monday, I got my answer. Wow. Yeah. Right. It's called, you know, your own narrative. You're so right. I love that term and the way you say it. Uh, it's something I didn't put in words before, but I knew, uh-uh, you don't get away with it now that I understand that truth has to come to the light. I don't care who you are or what you've done. I've done that with murderers coming to the light and confessing. Um, that's an interesting piece. I have found people when I was 20, I found a doctor who really didn't have a license. Um, I uncovered it. That was my first in a hospital and I loved it save baby's life mm. I'm going oh well you're gifted but you're gifted not okay you're going to have a blessed life here you're going to have life experiences on every side and then let's see what you do with it mm -hmm. oh my gosh I, I love the way you just put that oh my god I love you you're amazing everything that you're saying is just so 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 good Nancy and I love the way you just put that 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 because uh, I, I would often think it's it's not what happens to you, it's how you deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's not what you've done, it's your response to what you've done. It's, you know, if you screw up, do you hang on to it or do you learn from it? You know, something tragic happens in your life, do you wallow forever or do you get on top of it and then be able to help others? that have gone through the same thing because now you can relate in an entirely That's different way. Podcast. That's why you're doing this. I know. <laughs> right. Uh, That's why you're so cool. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Because you've been there. Yes. That's authenticity. Yeah. I mean, that's why I, I understood that's everyone in service of anything. Right. Mm -hmm. We are because we know. Right. And Absolutely. we don't want others to suffer. It's kind of like I watched some of the, um, and I don't watch true crime ever. I've seen all my documentaries once. No, thank you. That's fine. It, it was more than enough. <laughs> so, but I love every mystery show and I do love FBI and, and Law and Order and SVU. And I, I learn because SVU uh, Law and Order probably is the best in demonstrating because of Mariska Haggerty, who's become the angel of victims, for victims literally outside and for many years. She's won many humanitarian awards. She's just an amazing, having learned all of it and understood and came close to all of it. She is beautiful. And I watch that and go, yeah, we need reminders, I think, because in even real life shows, anything, you watch some people, I don't want to talk about it. And you can say to them, so you don't care what happens to the next person, huh? And that's a tell about who they really are. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
when I find that, if they are sitting with me and agree to sit with me, right? I'm not mm -hmm. going to talk about any of it. Oh, really? Okay. So you're going to live with guilt a long time. Right. 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 It's yeah. one thing, you know, that there are times in the world where you don't talk because it actually is not safe. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Mm, but you need to do something. I call it armchair sleuth and armchair prayers. So if you know of something where it happened to you and there's nothing to be done, no justice, no anything, and there was and there is again, what would you do? And so for me, I think that if you can imagine that we are wireless and have always been, that's how computers were born, because our brain is a computer, it doesn't judge, it cannot, it's data in, data out, whatever you program it, that's what you got. So unless you've got parasites in your brain, then you don't program anything, the parasites do. Truthfully, parasites in your brain is a book, and it's true. Science, so if you are not capable of having and seeking justice, you are capable of having a soul to soul, which means you cannot judge, you can only share that it would be appropriate if they came to the light, mm. right? Right. Which was the oddest thing because it was the first documentary of Core TV they asked me to do. And I thought, you chose that? The serial killer? I was very surprised. And then it became the most popular one in the world. It still mm -hmm. plays in the world again and again since 2004, March 4th. It's crazy. 20 years. Yeah, it's a long time. And then yeah. all the other stories were replayed also, about 12 of them or so. But that one's the most popular ever. It's been done on Sci-Fi Channel. It's been done everywhere. That one. And it took me a long time to realize because at the end of it is a prayer I did with three other people in my room, doesn't matter, and asking God to give him back the pain he has caused women. And that next morning he was caught. Wow. He turned himself in. Oh, wow. Fascinating, a woman knifing him in the back. <clears throat> wow. Hmm. Wow. I am feisty at times. So <laughs> I love it. And I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that was, for me, a shock that they thought that that was okay as a documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the detectives all said, this is what happened. Yeah. She told us. She told us everything, right? I had all the info. But for me, it was like, you want this as a documentary? <laughs> as <laughs> the result, Okay. But it's true, and when I stop and think about that, that's what happened for each thing that worked in life, whatever it is. So, and again and again with people who commit crimes, apparently I'm really good at asking that they take everything that they've done, carry it to the light and open up. And that's happened quite a few times now over the years. And I thought, okay, I finally get that it's only when we have, we don't even know why or what, but if we serve enough, perhaps universal algorithm of our creator goes, okay, for everybody's highest good, this is a good one. We can do this. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. I don't know. Yeah. But I think we can do something no matter what, in other words. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Nancy. Yeah, because it, it that's kind of what it comes down to too, right? Is just listening, being open and walking it out and, and doing it and what you do so beautifully. This has been so amazing. And I can't believe we're out of time because I could of course talk to you forever and of course want to talk to you again as soon as I can. And <laughs> right. Yeah. But I love what you said that it's about your soul, that your soul before you were in a body and your soul after the body's gone. And to be able to realize how important that separation is to make in your mind and, and the realization of it is, is game-changing, it's life-changing. 
And I appreciate that a lot that you mentioned that and so many other things. So much gold you delivered. Yeah, but I it wasn't me. So I can't tell you who came to me, but somebody came to me and said that. Not me. I didn't think it. <laughs> but that you shared it. But then you shared it, which well, sure. that's huge. Because, yeah. Well, not mine to hold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good right. point. Not mine to hold. That's a good life mantra, right? right. Not mine to hold. I, I like that. I like that too. Thank you. I can use it about my closet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then your husband will go, oh, you're getting rid of stuff. <laughs> Nancy, where can, people, where can people find you and, and find your wonderful work? Thank you. So Nancy Orlin, O-R-L-E-N, like Orlean without the A, Weber, 1B. Uh, you just look that up. I have a website by my name, .com. And I have a YouTube and Instagram, the rest. So they got the books and my books coming out sometime in, in October 2024 on Amazon and signed copies by my home. I love doing that both. And anybody interested in joining the launch party, Kim? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so we have a date for October 26th for our author group, you know. And earlier than that, I'll have the Kindle up right away with a three-day special sale. The day nice. comes. Right. Nice, so, nice, nice. And I'll keep I'll keep people informed too because I'll be I, posting about it and and make sure that it gets out there. And you have other books, and all of your books are so good. And uh, man, for people who have a pet and wonder what happens and wonder how to relate better to their pet, wonder what happens after they lose their pet because the devastation is so great and whatever you bring yeah. such healing to so many people. And I just want to say, Nancy, I just appreciate you so much. And I'm so grateful that we're connected. I'm so grateful. So am I. Mucho. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you, Nancy, again, for being here and Everybody, just until we see each other again, be blessed. Blessings. Yeah.